Welcome back to another episode of What's Up, Prof. Hello, Walter. Hi, Martin. Are you doing well? Martin, the question has been repetitive over more than two years. And the answer is always yes, even if it's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it depends on what we mean, like we've mentioned before, with are you well? Yes, if you ask someone how are you, and they answer you want the long version or the short version, then you know you're in trouble. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to be honest. Do you actually want to know, or do you, are you just asking because it's a rhetorical it's, question? It's a common courtesy. That's it. Well, let's open with a word of prayer and let's get started. Our Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us the blessing of doing these discussions. We ask that you enlighten our minds, also the viewers and listeners, and that you give us the Holy Spirit to guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, Martin, I find it so interesting that uh, we're living in a time when it seems as if, for the first time really, everything is coming together and the Lord really, really could be coming very soon, right? Mm. Why does nobody want it? I think there's a few answers to that probably. Scared. But, but even those that you would expect mm. it, that they would love to hear news like that, when you say that the time is... Short, very short, or if you dare say when the 6,000 should be up more or less, then uh, they all freak. Yeah. What is the problem? Don't they want to go home? I wish everybody would get that longing to go home. What I think is the blessed hope? Isn't that the glorious appearing of our Lord? Yes, but I think people are too caught up in the worldly things even if it's not um, looking for it, but you're so busy or time just runs away. I mean, just now, recently again, I heard numerous times, not in my lifetime. Mm. Huh? Yeah. Why? Why? So why would somebody answer like that? Why would somebody answer like that? So what is the Advent hope and eternal life? It's actually two things here, right? The ad Advent hope is the coming of Christ, but uh, it leads then to eternal life for those that have chosen the right path, right? Correct. The narrow path, actually. So it's very important that you link the requirements for eternal life to the Advent hope, because what's the point of hoping if there's no eternal life attached to it, right? True. Aren't you um, supposed to prepare for eternal life through the Advent hope that you have. Yes, well, you're hoping for the Advent hope to take place so that eternal life can become a reality. But you can't live your life now if you're looking forward to the eternal life. Now you're living it as a hooligan. <laughs> if you want to put it that way. <laughs> like a Halloweenigan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, that's not going to work. And it's actually ridiculous if you think we are looking forward to eternal life. They have celebrations like the day of death. Their day of death, of course, it's very fortuitous for them that it falls on the Reformation Day, which is the 31st, right? Mm. So they seem to overlap. Now, originally, of course, that was the time when the two apparently met, the dead and the living, and there was this crossover that was possible and this great communication. And uh, in actual fact, it's a very occult day. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about Halloween. It's just that you said hooligan. <laughs> <laughs> it triggered something. <laughs> All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part but then I shall know even as also I am known. And now by it by the faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. 
This is the one word I don't like the way that it's been translated, charity, because it's the word agape, which means this unselfish love mm -hmm. principle. But uh, charity, caritos, had been mingled in there. And there's, a, to me, a little bit of a works aspect in the word charity. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it is the best way to translate it, but we can live with it. And there abide these three, faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is charity. And I would just like to mention that love will be the abiding one as the other two will disappear at the second coming. Because in Hebrews we read, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But when we see face to face, then faith will have realized its substance because you're actually seeing it. Then you don't need faith anymore. And the evidence will be before our eyes. Martin, why was it so important to God that salvation should be by faith? Well, I think that will prove that you trust him in Imagine, what he says. Because if you learn to trust what you cannot see, mm. how much more so will you trust what you can see? Yeah, yeah. So not being able to see or to see through a glass darkly requires faith. Because that which you cannot see which you cannot comprehend, mm -hmm. maybe, you have to grasp by faith. So faith leads to hope. Mm -hmm. If you have no faith, then what are you hoping for? There's yeah. nothing to hope for, right? That's true. So what are we hoping for? And why are we hoping for something? We're hoping for eternal life. We're hoping for this world to come to an end. We're hoping for a better world. We're hoping for many, many things. Mm -hmm. And then there is this charity, this agape, which you have to develop because without it, you will not be able to be happy in heaven. It's the same Peter had the same problem. We all sit problem. with the same problem. Yeah, and we've been through that many mm -hmm. times. And then he had in his Peter's ladder, the final one was then agape, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to get there. But in order to get there, you need to have faith and you need to grasp salvation by faith. And then you need this hope. But the greatest of them will be the only one that remains. The other two will no longer be found in a dictionary because once reality has set in, mm. you do not need faith and you do not need hope because hope has been realized. Okay, so what are we hoping for? Psalms 31 verse 24, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope. In the Lord. So what are we hoping for, Martin? We have to... Well, it's actually we're hoping for the Lord to come and fetch us to have eternal life. Yes, that's your hope. So even if things look very bleak, that's your hope. Yeah. So your hope always centers again on your relationship with Christ and that He will come and save you. It's like a child that's waiting for his parent to come and pick him up. He knows he'll come. Psalms 33, verse 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. So hope is a very important thing, Martin. If we lose hope, then what do we look like? Depressed, downtrodden. So how many people do you think are without hope? I think humanity is, with well, everything that's happening these days, starting to lose hope. Just this week again, a young girl committed suicide. And I wrote to the people that informed me, I said, was there nobody that could give her some hope? We need hope, Martin. Without hope, 
Well, we will drown in this quagmire. That's the thing. Maybe the question that you asked, is there nobody? There is somebody, but nobody brings them to, that, to him anymore. That's Jesus. The yeah. only way we can truly get that real hope. I mean, sometimes you have a day that everything just goes wrong. You don't have days <laughs> like that, except today, perhaps. <laughs> See, but then you read something like this, and it, you realize, where is your hope? Yes, your hope has to be in the right place. Psalms 33, verse 22, Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. So is mercy coupled to hope? Yes. So does God actually want us to have hope? <laughs> the whole time. That's what, why he put it in the Bible. Do parents want their children to have hope? Yes. So God must want us to have hope, right? Yeah. Don't give up hope. Don't give up. So Martin, longing for the advent of Christ and perseverance in right doing are prerequisites for eternal life. Would you agree with that statement? Yes, definitely. Okay, does right doing get you to heaven? No. No faith gets you to heaven. Okay. If you wish to postpone the second coming or lose the fire, it is because you do not really love him. Could you make a statement like that? Yes. You could? Mm-hmm. Martin, then there must be hordes of people that don't really love him because they don't want him to come. Imagine you've just met the love of your life yeah. and you say, I don't want you to come. <laughs> There's something wrong. <laughs> it's, yeah, you know what? Again, logic. You cannot hope and then not long for it. Exactly. So modern theology negates the necessity for the second coming since the dead meet him at death and therefore the second coming is spiritualized away but the literal coming of Christ is, according to the Bible, the blessed hope, isn't it? So all of these things are pretty much connected. What is this denomination that you belong to called? The Seventh-day Adventists. All right, there are two aspects there, right? Yes. The one refers to the law, and the other one refers to the second coming. And both of them must be in the equation. They have to. You keep the seventh day until the Lord comes with his advent to take you home. And just say that again. You keep the seventh day holy until the Lord comes with the second advent to take you home. All right. Is, is the fourth commandment a commandment of relationship? Yes, completely. It's, the, it's absolute relationship. Is it, is it personally meeting you in a relationship? You know, it, definitely. So the thing is, remember that quote we had a few episodes back? about the light of the first table and the second table yes, yes. shining, and then the fourth commandment shining shines brighter. Bright. There's a reason for it. Yes. It's a seventh day is exactly what you've just said, All a right. relationship day. So that is the day when you have special time, right? If you have special time with someone that you really care about, but you only have a phone, in order to realize it. Mm. It's, it's okay, but is it the same as the actual physical presence? No. All right. Would you say, oh, oh, I don't need the physical presence, I've got the phone. <laughs> <laughs> huh? yeah, no. Doesn't work, eh? No. Okay. So, this aspect of life, John eleven twenty one. then said Martha unto Jesus when her brother had died, right? Lazarus. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. You know, if, if the world would just read the answer now, they should wake up to some certain nuances of doctrine, shouldn't yeah, they? Yeah. Martha said unto him, 
I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So when did you expect him to rise? At the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And the answer is, did she believe it? Yes, she absolutely. Be she that, believed it, but huh? she, she thought it will come then. Yes. Now, why did he say Lazarus sleepeth? Because he's not really dead. He's just sleeping temporarily. Mm -hmm. But he's dead because Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. dead. But if you are in Christ, you are just sleeping. sleeping. All right. So we know that there will be a resurrection. We know that the dead are not with Christ when they die. They know nothing. And therefore, everything ceases. Faith ceases. Hope ceases. Everything ceases. But that last thought that you die with, that's a very important thought. Who do you want to be with? And who do you know is coming to save you? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's have a look at what Paul wrote to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. So, Martin, when he says at that day, did he mean the day when he dies? No. Nope. No, he was speaking the same as Mar Martha. It's exactly the same words, right? And he makes sure that he cannot be misunderstood because he says, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So what was Paul's blessed hope? The resurrection. At the second coming. And, and the second coming, right? And did he love that appearing, that second oh, coming? Oh, yes, he says it. So how important is it that you love his appearing? Why yeah. does everybody want to put it off? It's, I don't think they have the hope and faith. I think if you want to put it off, the only reason that I think is valid is to ask for a little more, more time for those who are lost. But then that must be sincere and not be asking it with lip service. So actually you're looking for more time for yourself. But for us individually, surely you must love his appearing because you're going to get eternal life. It says here, basically, if you love his appearing. And if you love his appearing, then you have forsaken your sins and you have nothing mm. to hide and nothing to fear because your sins have gone before you. In Hebrews 9 verse 28 we read, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The Bible is very clear, huh? Everything happens at the second coming. Mm, mm. But you have to look for him. You have to love his appearing. Titus 2 verse 11 onwards, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious, glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. There you have that genitive, genitive, chi construction, the great God and the Savior, Jesus Christ, are one and the same. Mm. They are one. And this blessed hope is Clearly, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the looking is a verb. So it actually means you are really looking forward to this. 
Yes. Not just paying it lip service. You have to look forward to it. So Martin, if you're not looking forward to it, it means you're not ready. Or you don't have the right relationship. Isn't that, that's, isn't that that's axiomatic? It, again, we can come back to the girlfriend. or the If you, if you don't want to actually physically see her, <laughs> there's a problem. <laughs> there's definitely a problem. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So you have this combination. But it's all about relationship. All about relationship and understanding what Christ is actually doing for you. So some say the Lord delays his coming. Luke 12, 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. You have to be watching. Watching what? Signs that shows you the coming of the Lord is near. Okay. Even at the door. No. Uh, Imagine you were living in the olden days and the stagecoach was going to come at some stage and bring that someone. Would you be watching for a dust cloud <laughs> on the horizon somewhere? Especially when you're not sure exactly which hour is coming or which day. Yes, or whether it's delayed or whatever, yeah, right? Definitely. Every now and then you'll be looking. You'll be watching. You'll be watching for the signs. Okay. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. So this implies patience because you don't know is he coming in the first, the second or the third, right? And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered the house to be broken through. But ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. So in other words, here you have a comparison by contrast. Mm -hmm. If you know that thieves are going to break in, you'll be watching, right? Mm -hmm. How much more so if you're waiting for the Son of Man to come? And Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler of his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Everything is wrapped up in this blessed hope that the culmination of all things is at hand and that soon we will be able to go home. What a wonderful day that will be. Did Paul have it? Yes. Did Peter have it? Yes. Did John have it? Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we have it? Did Even Martin Luther have it? Yes. Did the early Adventists have it? Absolutely. So, like you said, what, what prohibits us from having it? Why is it seemingly lacking in our time? Yeah. What's gone wrong, Martin? I think it's because we're so close that the devil is so busy and he's keeping us busy. He's poured water onto the fire. Mm. There's another aspect that's very important, Martin. We may not minimize his coming. Mm. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Do we find it more and more? No. <laughs> Some of the theologians are experts at it. Hmm? Definitely. Saying to us, no, not, not for a hundred years. At least not for a hundred years. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Nothing's changed. Everything's the same. I don't know 
or what planet they're living on, but uh, it's definitely not the same. Hmm? I'm all the way with you there. Martin, this is also an interesting little statement in terms of evolution, because uh, everything continues as it was from the beginning is uniformitarianism. And uh, from that you get long ages. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's where they get their long ages <laughs> from because they've become uniformitarianists. <laughs> eh? It can be. It could be possible. There's another aspect. So we may not minimize mm -hmm. the coming of Christ. We may not say, where is this promise of his coming? Because these people are called last day scoffers. Well, you know, in Jesus' time and with Paul, they were already talking. So actually, if you take it, the last days started already there. Now, Up why, why was it called the last days? You know, Martin, mm. we are living in the last days. This has caused so much confusion in the world because the people say, oh, we've been living in the last days. Mm. Up until the time of Christ, there was only a promise. Yes. Up until the time of Christ, there was only a type. Here, there was an antitype. Mm -hmm. There were witnesses to the antitype. There were very precise witnesses. If you take uh, John, mm. let's just go, I think it's in Luke, Martin. Ah, here we are. We are in Luke. That's rather nice. Luke tells us quite precisely what the mission of John was. If you turn to Luke chapter 1, and we read there uh, what the mission was. Now, Zacharias was the father of John the Baptist. And uh, he disbelieved the angel, and so he was struck dumb. But uh, when the child was born, they asked what the name should be. And they chose the name John, and the people were perturbed because this was not a real family name. But then he wrote down that it was to be John, and then his, his tongue was loosened. And then he predicted what the mission would be. And he says in verse 71 that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, may serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And now he refers to John and he says, And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins. Now, Martin, shouldn't they have known that? Yes, actually, should. because everything in the sacrificial system was already pointing, showing, to, pointing this. to this. But he had to give knowledge of salvation. So at the end of time, when the antitypical Elijah comes, then... Is it necessary again to give knowledge of salvation? Well, yes. if you take away the law, there's no transgression, right? Where there's no transgression, do you need a savior? No. No. So do people need a knowledge of salvation again yes. in the time that Definitely. we live in? Well, can, I, can, can we just jump back to verse 6? Yes. Just look there about Zacharias and his wife. Yes. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all his commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. So they just taught their son the same. They taught their son the same. Well, Martin, righteousness by faith can become a very confusing subject. 
Otherwise, there would have not been so many anathemas against it, right? <laughs> so he had to give knowledge of salvation, verse 77, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. That's a very important mission, don't you think? And this was the type. Yeah. And we are now at the anti-type. You know, Martin, if I, if I continue this story, I know I'm, I'm going off topic again because <laughs> <laughs> it seems like we constantly do this. But uh, we read there in chapter 2 what happened when the birth of Jesus was announced to the shepherds, right? Mm. And we read from verse 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. This is Mary now. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Have you mulled that one over? Mm -hmm. This is the Son of God being born, and there was no room for them in the inn. Mm. So Now, the inn is always a very important one. We'll come to the inn in this study later yeah. as well. Because the inn is actually the hospital, the church. church. There was no room for Christ in the church. <laughs> he was a square peg in a round hole. He didn't fit in. And it was expedient that he should die for the sake of the nation than that the nation should die for the sake of him, right? Yeah. So this is all very typological as well as actual. So... He was laid in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. He should have been in luxury, in kingly environment, yeah, yeah. but there was no room for him in this environment. And then, interestingly, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. Have you ever read that typologically rather than literally? Well, it's like watchmen on the wall. Okay. So there were in the same country. And why say that? <laughs> why say in the same country? Or could we say in the same church? Mm -hmm. Yes. There was no room for him. There was none. He was laid in a manger. That's there it. was no room for him. But yes. <laughs> in the same church, in the same country, there were shepherds. Mm. What are shepherds supposed to be a type of? Pastors, right? Yes. Abiding in the field. Now, in other parables, there were fields. Jesus said, there were treasures hidden in a field. Now, what's the field? The, the Word of God, right? Yeah. The Word of God. So there were shepherds abiding in the field. Martin, there, there were Keeping. people that studied the Scriptures. They were abiding in the field. And what were they doing? They were keeping watch. Yes, watchmen. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Tending to the flock. You know what? You could you could start reading this. It's amazing. And and you won't get very far because there's so much to mull yeah. over if you start read. reading it typologically, right? Keeping watch. For what reason were they keeping watch? Because they were keeping watch over their flock. Yes. And when did they keep watch by over the flock? By night. <laughs> what? <laughs> Does that typology strike you? Oh, definitely. It's amazing. Uh, are we living in the night of this we world? We are right there. When is Christ going to come? At what time does the Bible say? He will come at midnight. Okay. Is it dark then? Pe it's the darkest part of the night, right? He's coming at night. 
So modern, there must be shepherds in the same country. <laughs> what about the others? There was no room for him. Yeah. Martin, nothing has changed. Nothing. Nothing has changed. That just brings us again back to what we've started off with. Okay, so we did a sidetrack, but that just proves it has to do with it. It's the last days. It's the last days. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. Now, why did the glory shine around them? Because they were abiding at night, taking care of their flocks. They were better equipped to take the message than were the learned people and the prelates. Because Precise. they had no room for it. They were actually busy with their father's work. Well, I was being sidetracked, so let me put the Bible down again. And let's read that. So in other words, Martin, we must not minimize his coming. And we must persevere. We must be watching. And the darker it gets, the more we need to watch. Mm. Romans 2 verse 7, To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. There's something to strive for. But you may not give up halfway. You must continue. Ephesians 1 13, In whom you also trusted, after that ye have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Yeah, deep words, Martin. Or 1 John 2 verse 28, Now little children abide in him, and when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. It's a recurring theme. And uh, if, we, if we miss the point, we could miss the bus. And it, like you mentioned in the previous one, not at death, at his coming. Correct. In 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 13, we read, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Everything culminates in that point. It is is the blessed hope. And there is no way that you can get around it. Mm. But you have to be a shepherd. You have to watch by night. And you have to take care of the flock. Who's your brother? And who's your neighbor? Everybody, Everybody. that is around you, right? Exactly. So here's a, a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. It is the duty of every believer to fulfill faithfully his baptismal vows. If earnest perseverance and diligence are needed in order to attain success in temporal matters, how much more important that we make earnest efforts to obtain the heavenly treasure? So, Martin, we need to encourage each other. We need not be distracted by those who have no room for the second coming. True. Don't let they steal from you your blessed hope. John 8, 13, The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. John 15, verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Continue in my love. So you have this constant contrast. You have the unbelievers and then you have those that continue and persevere. Romans 11.22 Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity but towards thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. So how important is perseverance? Life and death. Goodness and severity of God. It's amazing how many people only see the severity of God. His wrath. 
with this second coming. But it's actually his goodness yes. because he's coming to take It the, depends on what side of the fence you're standing. That's it. All right, there'll be two sides. The one will say, rocks fall on us. Hide us from the face of the one who comes with the clouds, right? And the other lot will say, this is our God on whom we have waited. He will save us. So, verse 24, 1 John chapter 2, Let there therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which we have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Once you know the truth, don't let yourself be sidetracked. Mm. Don't let someone rob you, as you just said, of the blessed hope. Because if they have robbed you of the blessed hope, you have nothing left. Nothing. Nothing. So here's this young man who called Jesus good master. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? How many people ask that these days? Many, right? Many, many. And he said unto them, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But is it possible that this young man knew that he was dealing with God himself? I think so, yes. And therefore he called him good master. And Jesus sort of highlighted it by saying, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Are you saying, young man, that you realize that you are speaking to God? But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Has the Lord in the meantime decided that that is obsolete? <laughs> it's so plain. <laughs> and the thing is, now you try, most people try and get around this, oh, but he's not speaking about the Ten Commandments here. Excuse me. Oh, okay. <laughs> then why does he list them? Exactly. Oh, but then they get to the pause. Yeah, but he's not mentioning all of them. And, I mean, if you want to get out of it, you will think up an excuse. Okay. He said unto him, which? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So here he lists the second table uh -huh. and he sums it up by saying this is love your neighbor. But why did he not list the first one? You say he left out half. Why did he not list the first one? Because he knew that was the part that was missing with the young. With that was his problem, right? Yeah. So uh, this rich young ruler was quite happy to share some of his riches with his neighbor. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't prepared to share it all with God. Isn't it amazing? We are back at that part where if you don't adhere to the first table, the second table is null and void. It doesn't matter if you are looking out for your brother, you're doing everything right, but you've lost your You cannot get relation. the power if you haven't got the first table. The light, the light that you bring to them are in the first table. That's why I said, this young man said unto him, all these things I've kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Well, what didn't he mention? <laughs> You must love God. Relationship. All right. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Martin is speaking like the Pope there, right? <laughs> Isn't that what the Pope says? Yeah. Go and sell everything you have and come and live in a monastery and uh, shut yourself away. Hmm. Yeah, and his buddies, the World Economic Forum's got it the same. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. All right. So Jesus said, go and get rid of everything that you have and come and follow me. That was, that was a price too high to pay. But I think it was a very spiritual thing. All right. Well. Now, once you do that, mm. 
Once you lay it all on the altar and are prepared to lose it all, isn't it amazing that God sometimes turns it round? Oh, yes. Do you really lose it all or do you gain it all? Gain all. You gain it all, right? Definitely. Even if you lose it all in terms of the monetary aspect, you will still gain it all. All right? That's it. You'll gain, gain the true riches. Isn't that why God also said, Seek ye first the kingdom? Yes. And all these things will be added. Now, there were many that were rich in the days when uh, Jesus was on this earth. Nicodemus was a rich man. He basically funded the, the fledgling church. Mm -hmm. So he used his riches wisely. But this young ruler was not prepared to give everything to the poor. Now, who are the poor, Martin? Poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. Those who are in need of salvation. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He was short-sighted. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who can then be saved? Now it's interesting that in the mindset at that time, if you were rich, you were blessed of God. Mm -hmm. That's Therefore, it was proof that you were part of the kingdom. And here Jesus goes and he turns it around. Is there anything wrong with having money? No. No. It's the love of money that's the problem, not money. So don't trust those new translations that leave the love of out of that sentence. But then Jesus, beholding them, said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So the problem is not money. It's the love of money that's the problem. It's when you put that above the relationship you have with God. Yes. What did he say to Zacchaeus? He said he must pay back everything that he stole. Yes, and what did Zacchaeus do? He did exactly that. He said, if I've wronged anyone, I will repay. And I will multiply what I have repaid. But he didn't tell him to quit his job. No. Neither did John the Baptist tell those that came to him that they had to quit. He said, be satisfied. And when he was gone forth unto his way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? This is the story now, the same story in the Gospel of Mark. We just read it in Matthew. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. All right, Martin, so here in the story, as we read it in Mark, there is a little bit of additional information. You read here, he came running and he kneeled to him. Mm -hmm. So is there merit in the thought that he knew that he was dealing not with an ordinary man? Yes. Hmm? Yes. Okay. The rest of the story here is the same, but it has another twist. Because Jesus says, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said to him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. That's another addition. So we have two things. He kneeled, yeah. and it says Jesus loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Now, Love your neighbor and love God. Yes. 
All right. So what is God asking for? He's asking for reciprocity. God loves you. Therefore, you should love God. Yeah. Now, in your relationship, do you have a relationship if one loves and the other one does not? No. Oh. No, that one. <laughs> it has to be reciprocal. Definitely. Right? Otherwise, it's, it's not going to work. <laughs> no. It's going to be useless, right? So, Martin, is it unreasonable for God to say you must love me? No, not at all. Because he loves you. Isn't it a marriage relationship? Yes. All right, so if it's a marriage, it must be reciprocal. So God is not unreasonable. Satan says he's unreasonable. Mm. But he's not unreasonable no. because that's the nature of love. Yes, but Satan says that because he's interpreting it he demands you love him. But he forgets to put in the part that God loved you first. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. While we were yet sinners, God died for us. So he must love us. Yes. Because greater love is no one than he who lays down his life. Right? Yeah. For a friend. So these little interesting nuances that are added in here just bring the story alive. Go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. I think that last part is what really got to him. Would he have had any lack if he followed? Nothing. Have you had lack since you followed? No. Have I had lack since I followed? No. You see, but your eyes opened. Because if you sometimes... Look in a worldly view. Some people will say, "Well, that we did lose," because their eyes are not open to having the blessed hope and seeing that fulfillment of um, having everything that you need. My wife just finished writing the book on our experiences or some of our experiences, and. Uh, when we read it again, we were absolutely amazed at how God has led throughout all of these years. And to think where we came from and where we are now. And what happened to those that didn't budge, that didn't move? Am I worse off or better off? We have to ask ourselves these questions, even if times are tough. That's it. Are we worse off or better off? Well, there's another story. A certain lawyer came to him and said, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to have inherit eternal life? And again, it's from the Gospel of Luke. And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Isn't it interesting that in both cases, he talks about the law Definitely. and the commandments? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. So this lawyer had both tables. He got that bit right, right? And he said to him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Yeah. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, mm. Who's my neighbor? Now, that's typical. Now, would he have asked that question if he was really keeping the first table? No, he wouldn't have. No. no, he wouldn't have. But he did. He asked it. Now, the Jews, did they consider themselves the elect? Exactly. Mm -hmm. How many religious systems have election? <laughs> All of them. All right. Protestant denominations yeah. as well? All right. And Jesus answering said, and he tells a story. And the story completely blasts this young lawyer out of the water, right? Now, we've read it many times, but let's go through it, because this is what it entails to be part of the people that are waiting and watching for the coming of the Lord. Mm. A certain man... That's generic. 
It's very generic. A certain man. Yeah. Could be anyone, right? Went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now Jericho was a cursed city. Jerusalem was the city of salvation, right? You can't go up to Jericho. You can only go down. And he fell amongst thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. Now, if we had to read this story typologically, then we're saying humanity, generically, has departed from the Jerusalem principle and is heading towards the Jericho principle. And if you do that, you will fall amongst thieves and they will strip you of your robe of righteousness. Mm -hmm. In other words, the demons will get hold of you and they will wound you and they will leave you half dead. Yeah. And by chance, there came a certain priest that way and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So who's who is he talking about? The Pharisees. All right. So here were these people that thought they were the elect of God. They were saved. This miserable specimen over there, he was obviously not worthy. God never protected him. And so he walked by on the other side. And then a Levite came. And when he was at the place, came, looked on him and passed by on the other side. This, this is stunning. The other one, he just passed by. This one had a look. <laughs> he went and had a look at this miserable specimen. And he decided, not worth it. And he walked on. Martin, if sin-struck people are the problem, how many people say, don't deal with that one, don't get involved or try to help this one or that one with his weird hairstyle and five nose rings or whatever. Uh, have a look at that and pass by on the other side. Does it happen today? Mm -hmm. But a certain Samaritan, now that was a swear word. Apparently this story actually took place. And Jesus used it in a spiritual format then. So here was a Samaritan, very much despised by these people as he journeyed. Now, this is interesting because this Samaritan didn't come down from Jerusalem. He wasn't on his way to Jericho. He journeyed. He came where he was. That's fascinating. Do you sometimes meet people where they are? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's supposed to. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Now, we've spoken about an inn before, right? Mm. This was a very special inn because it was a hospital. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. That should give you a clue. But Who this despised one, for whom there was no room, <laughs> really was. It was a Samaritan. Because the Jews called Jesus, Thou art a Samaritan. Yeah. Thou hast the demon. They hated what he stood for. His church didn't have place for him. There was and no room. There was no room. He had to be laid in a manger. No, okay, but fortunately there were some shepherds out in the field that did take care of the flock. So Martin, this Samaritan is a type of Christ, despised, rejected by men. But he was on a journey to come where we are to meet us in our need. And then he poured out something very interesting, oil and wine. Oil is the Holy Spirit. Wine is the doctrine. He set him on his own beast. He carried him. 
his own beast. It's also a symbol of the church, the true shepherds. Because he takes him to an inn, he takes him to the church and took care of him. He himself took care of him. And then on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence. Now a pence was a day's wages. So he gave two days' wages. And gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell amongst the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. He didn't want to say the Samaritan. <laughs> <laughs> so he sort of yeah. uh, moved around it. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Mm -hmm. So that's a very, very important lesson. There's another lesson in here. He gave him two pence. That's two days' wages. Martin, if we think in terms of the cosmic week, mm. where a day is a thousand years, <laughs> then two days' wages would be two cosmic days. That would be 2,000 years. Martin? I dare not go further, right? We'd get into trouble, right? Yeah, well, maybe the Good Samaritan will not in too distant future come and pay what they at the inn did more. Uh -huh, what the innkeeper did more. Well, Martin, it's just an interesting thought. Uh, some of our early pioneers mm -hmm. believed that the two pence were a reference to a time frame of 6,000 years because Jesus came at 4,000 mm -hmm. plus the 2,000. And when he comes, he will repay those that actually did the work they should be doing at the inn, taking care of the wounded and the bruised and the sick, not walking by on the other side. Here's another indication that I don't think we're too far off in terms of the time frame. Now, let's just unpack this Jericho a little bit. Jeremiah 6, verse 26, O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning as for an only son. Most bitter lamentation for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. 1 Kings 16, 34, in his days did Hiel the Bethlehite build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof with Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof with his youngest son, Zegub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. That city was never to be rebuilt. Yeah. We should never go down to Jericho. Mm -hmm. But they rebuilt it. And it cost him his firstborn and it cost him his youngest son. It's a high price to pay. You can lose a lot, Martin, if you try to rebuild Jericho. Yeah, yeah. If... And we have the same lamentation to do. We have to mourn as for an only son. For the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. We need to be prepared. Now, Jesus was despised, as we know. It says in Isaiah that he was despised and rejected of men. There was no room for him. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. That sentence in John. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. John 8, 47, He that is of God heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Can you see the relationship there? So was Jesus referring to himself when yes. he told the story? Yep. Jesus said that his burden is light. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is it therefore a difficult thing that he asks of us? No. Go and do likewise. And he will do the good thing in you if you let him. 
Okay, so what is our task, Martin, while we wait for the coming of the Lord? What did the shepherds do? They watched. Yes, keeping when? the flock. Oh, at night. At night. Mm. Okay. What's the second thing we must do? Oh, we should seek the lost. Okay. We should go and bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted. We should we bring them to the church? What about the Levite <laughs> and the priest in the church? They'll walk by. We'll have them in the church, right? That's it. We should also treat them as the one that we were looking after that were lying next to the road. So we must also pray for them and help them? Mm -hmm. Now people write to me a lot, Martin, and they say this and that and the other was just said in a sermon. Mm. What should I do about it? I say, pray for the man. The man needs prayer. But he's a pastor in the church. Well, then he needs more prayer. Exactly. <laughs> You know, often I can say where he was educated, what he did, etc. But let's not go there. It's amazing. And, and you know who writes? Young, on fire, new converts. Yeah. They can see when something is seriously amiss. And when someone doesn't want the Lord to come yeah. again. So we have to look at the mission of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. So that's our job, right? That's it. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. That same that's lying next to the road. Okay. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. In other words, to preach the gospel to the unconverted. Will you be loved or will you be treated like a Samaritan? Yep, you'll be hated. Okay. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Is there a day when Christ will come? Yes. All right, so you have to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now's the time of salvation. Mm -hmm. But you also have to preach the second coming of Christ. To whom? To comfort all that mourn to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion and to give them beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. This was Christ's work. Yeah. Why did that young girl commit suicide? Because she was never educated in beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, and a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. Isn't that a sad world we're living in? This is a continuous trend in the world today. We've lost all of this. That's right. why the world is in the state that it is. Isn't it time that God's people rallied around this call? Isaiah 42, verse 6, And I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand. I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Constantly you have this theme. We have evangelism to do. We cannot... We dare not be like the priest and the Levite. We have to meet the people where they are. We mustn't run away from those that are bleeding. We should bind them up and bring them to the inn. Yeah. And by the way, those wages, they are more or less used now. Hmm? That's it. The two pence are gone. It's, they're gone. Okay. You are witnesses, Isaiah 43, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So what's important here? You are to be a witness. You are to be a servant to do what? To know and believe him. 
to show who he is, that he is God. I, even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Martin, how does this fit into interreligious relationships? You cannot no. compromise. You have to lead people to the one who can save. There is no other Savior. So the, what gain can you have in trying to do this ecumenical work? All right. Let's just take a step back. I've been thinking about this lately. Mm. Ecumenism. Why is it necessary in the eyes of the world to have ecumenism? Mm. Isn't it to reach a compromised position where we can all live safely next to each other? Yes. Huh? That's what they're aiming for, yes. All right. The fact that you need ecumenism doesn't that automatically imply that you are excluding truth? Yes. Because you wouldn't need ecumenism, you would just have one truth. That's it. So as soon as you need ecumenism, you are propagating a lie. Yeah, true. Because then even the people that are in that ecumenism, they are denying something. They are compromising on something. Yes in order to accommodate someone who doesn't want to accept whatever that yeah. is. Therefore, ecumenism cannot be from God, period. Yeah. Because it is an unwillingness to sacrifice for the sake of truth. The more you think about it, the more you have to start realizing God cannot be inside of an ecumenical council. He cannot. He cannot compromise on truth. No. There's only one truth. There's only one Savior. And there's only one way to salvation. You cannot have salvation by works compromising with salvation by faith. Mm. Therefore, you cannot have a joint declaration on justification that includes works. Because works has nothing to do with justification. You, works are a consequence and they are sanctification. So the whole issue of compromise is impossible to reconcile with truth. Yeah. Ephesians tells us in chapter 3 from verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. The task of the church is to preach the message of salvation and to bring hope to the world and there is only one way in which this can be achieved. No compromise can be made with this. And that is so important because in ecumenism, you think that you're going to have hope and no. blessings. No. But that is the falsehood, the false hope. Yes, you, you are covering up. You are covering up and you are compromising on issues that are essential to salvation. In John chapter 6, we read, Then Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the word of eternal life. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of God and drink his blood, you have no part in him. And they all left. Do you also want to go? Jesus said. Where can we go? Peter answered and said, Lord, To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Isn't this what should be told to an ecumenical council and to an interreligious relationship? If you do not accept that you have to eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God to internalize Him, you have no part in Him. And if they all turn away, then maybe Peter will remain and say, where shall I go? You have the words of eternal life. That whatsoever, John 3, 15, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
always comes back to that day, right? Yeah. The blessed hope. So, how can you bring hope if you're not talking about that day? Correct. And John 17, verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Martin, it is so clear. Our gospel commission is so straightforward that there cannot be another or another nuance. It's either this or nothing. So we've read this verse in Romans before, that you have to have patient continuance in doing these things. And 1 John 5, 11 says, and this is the record that God has given to us, eternal life. And this life is in His Son. And whatever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing to Him. Can you, can you divorce any one of these aspects? No. And that's why, and again, we can have a broken record, but... That's why you cannot substitute or compromise on any of this. You cannot compromise on it. This is the way it is. And the plan of salvation says we are transgressors. We have no hope unless we have a Savior. Mm. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ can impute and impart his righteousness to us of which we have no part so that we may have his life and his righteousness in which we have no part. This is, this is an amazing gospel of salvation. There is no other. No. And we have to keep the commandments because we have to come back into harmony with God. Not to be saved, but because we are saved. That's it. 1 Timothy 6, 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Martin, that's the crux of the matter. Mm. There's no compromise possible. This is the way it is, and that's the way it's going to stay until the end. This is our marching order. This is our job. And our hope. Yes. And it will culminate in the second coming of Christ. So Martin, if we do these things, then we can say with all the rest of the saints, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are living in this dramatic time when these events will take place. And we are in that generation that will see these things if we remain faithful. Help your people not to give up now, but to redouble their efforts. And let us stand firm in the blessed hope of the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.